Well, what's up, church? How we doing? Good? Good, good, good. Happy football day to you. Thank you, thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, well, before we get started, I would just like to see how many like-minded individuals we have in the room this morning. Um, the Super Bowl. I love the football itself. I love the commercials. I love the food. love the silly little games you play, the squares. One thing I could do without... I could do without the halftime show. Just being honest, that's me. Who are my halftime show only people? I know that you exist. I'm just here for the halftime show. Don't care about anything. Excellent. We can still be friends. We can still be friends. Who's like me? Likes it all and the halftime show is like me. Whatever. Okay. All right. My people. My people. Hey, so we, uh, we've, we are concluding our series called Asking for a Friend. We've been tackling some of the tough questions about the Christian faith. Uh, it's been great. Um, I, uh, I think it's a super clever title, and I like it a lot. However, I've been thinking, man, I just love that the culture of our church that's been set by Pastor Scott and the leadership here is one where you don't need to ask for a friend, one where you can come and just ask the question for yourself, where you don't have to have everything figured out, and if you're trying to work through stuff, this is the place where you should come and do it. Uh, I was just thinking about that even as uh, in regards to the title of our series, um, Man, if you've got questions coming out of the series, continue to ask away. Fire, fire, fire. Uh, I love apologetics, defending the faith. One of my favorite topics. I think it's so important for us to have like a foundation, a good reason for why we believe what we believe. Um, just as I continue to work with high school students, adults, my own life, I realize that there are just those moments and seasons of life where we are prone to have doubts. Uh, on the smaller end, just like normally as we go through life, the Lord doesn't necessarily feel close all the time. We don't walk through 100% of life and be like, man, the Lord feels so close all the time. That's just not true. And I think we're prone to moments of having doubts. On the bigger end of things, man, there are those storms and tough times of life that come uh, that kind of rock us a little bit. And I think it's very natural for us to have those same doubts and wonder, man, is God even here? Is God even real? Um, and Lindsay and my story recently, for those that aren't familiar, uh, we just lost our firstborn son, uh, little Josiah Joshua, little JJ back in October. Uh, man, it's been a tough, it's been a tough go. Um, and uh, I was just thinking about kind of in regards to apologetics and having foundation for our faith. Um, we spent two and a half weeks in the hospital leading up to his birth before he, uh, we got four really sweet days with him. Um, four hard days, but four really sweet days. Um, we spent those two and a half weeks in the hospital leading up and we knew that the prognosis wasn't good and things weren't looking good. We were just kind of hoping and praying for a miracle during that time. And I remember two specific times during our, our stay in the hospital where I was just like, a wreck, just an absolute wreck, it felt like, for two and a half weeks straight. And I remember two specific moments during that where the thought crept in, maybe there's not a God. Um, this is just so, like, this is just so hard. I couldn't, like, I don't know, I didn't have a perfect framework for why I thought that or why that thought crept in. Um, but it did, um, two specific times, and just in the middle of this just, like, junk and uh, honestly, what brought me back was having foundation for why I believe what, believe what I believe. Um, I, uh, I just preached a, uh, an apologetic series with our high school students back in the spring. And I kind of, I still remember one time I was just sitting there in the hospital. The other time I was like walking aimlessly through the halls. And uh, I was kind of just like preaching my own apologetic series back to myself. Um, just that foundation, that core, why I actually believe this. Um, the reason that I follow Jesus today is not because it always feels great or there's always gonna be this amazing, like, it's just gonna feel so good. And emotionally, I'm just gonna be right there. Um, the reason I follow Jesus today, 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 is because he's real, is because his word is true. Uh, and we can logically know so. Uh, I've been learning, or at least relearning, uh, over the past few weeks and months that, man, just sometimes our head, our brains need to lead the charge in our relationship with God when our hearts aren't quite there. Um, and man, just so important to cling to truth. Just cling to truth even when it doesn't feel good. 
Um, in my personal own investigation and just diving in, um, I'm convinced personally um, that the Christian faith, what we know uh, about Jesus, um, that explains the way the things are in the world the best, and it requires actually the least amount of faith out of any other worldview. Um, now, I know that pastors are really good at using hyperbole. Uh, however, today, today, the topic that we're going to study today might be the most important topic in the history of the universe. True story. So we're going to dive in. If the events that we're looking at today actually happened, we don't need any other proof. Like nothing else is needed. Christianity is true. Jesus is who he says he was. We should surrender our lives, our everything to him. On the, on the contrary, if it's not true, if the events that we're looking at today didn't happen, every single one of us is a joker. Like we are wasting our times. Why are we even sitting here? I need a new profession, like badly. Um, as you can see there in our bulletins, uh, we're looking at answering the question, can Jesus' resurrection be trusted? Now, without the resurrection, there is no Christianity. Before the resurrection occurred, there was no Christianity. Even when Jesus himself was out walking around, teaching, healing, doing his thing, there was no Christianity. There was not Christianity until the resurrection happened. I cannot overstate the importance of Jesus' physical resurrection. Um, the entire case for Christianity, to say it another way, is wrapped up in the topic that we are going to discuss here in the next 30 minutes. Uh, Josh, no pressure. Here we go. So you guys are in luck. You guys are in absolute luck because we have discovered new evidence. The original ring the ancient hidden video camera was right outside of the tomb. We've got evidence that Jesus walked straight out. Man, how sweet would that be, right? If we had some like videos that we could pull up? We do not, unfortunately. However, the evidence that we are going to look into today, I would argue, is extremely convincing. As we look back into history, as we look into everything that we can know, uh, it is extremely, extremely convincing. Uh, what I'm going to do today is I'm going to cover four topics. I'm going to kind of like have an, an overhead view, and I'm going to sprint through. Like, we got lots of stuff to cover. We're going to move pretty quick, but I'm going to look at four different things as it relates to the resurrection. First, we're going to take a look at Jesus' death. There cannot be a resurrection unless we have a death. Jesus can't rise from the dead unless he definitely died, and so we're going to look at that. Then we're going to look at Jesus' burial. Um, and the empty tomb, what do we know about where Jesus was buried? And sitting here 2,000 years later, how can we know for sure that that tomb was empty 2,000 years ago? We're going to look at that. Then we're going to discuss Jesus' post-mortem appearances after he was dead. He appeared. We're going to talk about those. And we're going to conclude and kind of wrap up with the drastic transformation of different groups and individuals. And that kind of ties everything together at the end. When we get there, in the end, I'm going to argue uh, that the best explanation for everything that we know historically is that Jesus actually conquered death. He actually rose from the dead physically. Um, now, I know that there's probably different groups of people out here today. Um, and so if you are, would consider yourself just kind of like seeking or looking into things or skeptical or just trying to figure things out, not really sure, uh, my hope today is, is kind of like one of those light bulb moment, moments. Um, I hope that it's really good information and nothing else. I hope that it starts really cool conversation and brings up more questions. Uh, I think that would be a very useful um, way to use our time. And then if you are following Jesus already, my hope is that this is a sweet refresher. Um, and maybe there's some things that you've never heard before and are really good tools in your tool belt as you engage the world around you. Let me pray. And then we are going to dive right in. Dear Lord, uh, God, I just thank you for a chance to be um, here. I thank you for a chance to be together. I thank you for a chance to dive into what we can know historically about the resurrection of Jesus. Lord, I thank you that you've given us um, clues that you don't just kind of leave us without any uh, historical evidence. Thank you that you can be found using the use of our brains and reason and logic. Um, and I also pray uh, and thank you that you search after our hearts, that you seek us, and that you're pursuing us, Lord. Uh, Lord, I pray that I would get out of the way. I pray that you would speak, that you would clear my mind uh, in order to just communicate clearly. Um, we love you. We thank you. Uh, we worship you today. We pray this in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. 
So as promised, uh, the first topic that we're going to look at is Jesus' death. So today, um, most people, Christian, non-Christian, most people today do not deny the fact that Jesus died via crucifixion. There are some, uh, kind of the leading view, really the only view held by skeptics today, is that somehow... Jesus, either he fainted or he was drugged, but somehow he ended up off the cross and into the tomb alive but unconscious. It's known as the swoon or the apparent death theory. It started back in the 1700s. Um, It's been widely discredited since about the 1830s. Um, And the reason for that is just because there's too many facts that speak to the contrary. The facts say this. First of all, surviving a Roman crucifixion just wasn't a thing. Roman soldiers were trained executioners. They were incredibly good at what they did, and they had reason to be incredibly good at what they did and made sure they finished the job. Because if a Roman soldier did not uh, successfully kill their victim, they were held personally responsible and were killed in their place. In the case of Jesus, Pilate had a specific centurion assigned to make sure that Jesus was dead before he got in the tomb. So that man absolutely would have made sure that he was dead before he got into the tomb. Additionally, Jesus was in really, really bad shape before he even got to the cross. Uh, We know he was flogged, he was whipped, Um, his veins, arteries, intestines, everything just kind of laid bare. Uh, He was in incredibly bad shape. That would have been enough to just kill him by itself. And then he went to the cross. On top of that, on the cross, it's documented that they pierced his side to make sure he was dead and out came blood and water is how it's described. It's nice having medical uh, advancements and modern science. Today, we can speak in medical terms and know that that was the serum that had separated from the clotted blood. Again, proving that he was already dead before he went into the tomb. However, let's just say somehow, somehow he managed to get by all of those things and into the tomb alive. A couple of questions come up. Number one, how would he escape the grave clothes? He was wrapped up pretty well in those linens. How would he have gotten through those? Then how would he have rolled the stone away from the tomb and escaped past the guards? How would he have walked seven miles to meet up with the disciples? And how would he have inspired those disciples in the state that he was in to start this movement, proclaiming him as God in the flesh uh, and willing to die following him as their leader? None of that adds up. Uh, None of that adds up in my brain. Additionally, we have the testimony of non-Christian historians back in the first century that uh, I've got two of them that both attest to the fact that Jesus died via crucifixion. One of them is Tacitus. He was a Roman historian in the first century and Josephus was a Jewish historian back then. Uh, They both record Jesus' death. Again, the theory has been widely discredited um, and I would argue that it takes way, way more faith to believe that Jesus didn't die on the cross than to take the fact that he did. My opinion. Uh, I would argue that it is safe to say that Jesus' death by crucifixion, historical fact, we can count on that today. And we're gonna move on to section number two. You guys with me? Yep, excellent. Jesus' burial in the empty tomb. So the historical accounts that we have tell a really interesting story about Jesus' burial in the empty tomb. Can anybody tell me Whose tomb Jesus was buried in? Loudly? Excellent. Joseph of Arimathea. Um, So a couple of reasons why that is such widely distributed knowledge today. Number one, we're in the church, right? Church people know it because that's the account that we get from the gospels. We're told in the gospels that he was buried in Joseph of Arimathea's tomb. The other piece that's, that's pretty interesting is that there is no other conflicting tradition there's no other conflicting tradition. The only thing that we come, uh, have coming out of the early accounts is that he was buried in Joseph of Arimathea's tomb. That's it. So what do we know about Joseph of Arimathea? Very briefly, uh, we know he was a member of the Jewish Sanhedrin, which is the high court group that unanimously voted to kill Jesus. So Joseph would have been one of the guys that voted to have Jesus killed. He was a recognizable guy, had a recognizable name, kind of like a U.S. senator. Uh, And the big thing that goes along with that is 
people back then would have known exactly where Jesus was buried. They would have known the exact spot, the exact place. Nobody would have been left wondering, man, where is his body? They all, they all knew. I mentioned that it was interesting, right, the, the story that we have from history. Well, it's interesting because it wasn't Jesus' family or his close followers, his disciples, that went and got his body. And I think that begs the question, did his family and close uh, disciples, his close followers, did they think that Jesus was going to physically rise from the dead? They did not. When Jesus died, no, they did not think, even his closest family and friends did not think he was rising from the dead. A couple of reasons. Number one, that was not on anybody's radar back then. An individual physical rising from the dead, not on anybody's radar. And if they did think so, if they would have like somehow thought that they did, they absolutely would have went and got his body, right? If you're following this dude and he dies and you think he's going to raise from the dead, you go and grab his body so that it's there when he comes back to life, right? They did not think that he was going to rise from the dead. And we can, again, look at, look at what actually happened. Um, when the women went to the tomb to check it out and they saw that his body wasn't there, what was their response? They thought, man, his body has been stolen. Then when the women go and tell the men, Jesus has risen, he's alive. The men thought the women were crazy. They did not think that Jesus was rising from the dead. It's kind of an embarrassing story for the early church if you think about it. If the disciples had created this resurrection story, they would have done things very differently. They would not have used Joseph of Arimathea. They would not have painted themselves in such a bad light. And the biggest thing is they definitely would not have used women as the primary witnesses. Absolutely would not have. Back then, women were viewed as second-class citizens. Their testimony would have been no good. The idea that they were the primary witnesses to the empty tomb would have made no sense back then. Nobody would have bought the story. The gospel accounts, as I've said, they clearly contend that the tomb was empty. However, I don't even think that's the biggest evidence for all of that we've stated before. I don't think that's the biggest evidence for why the tomb was actually empty. The biggest evidence for why the tomb was actually empty back then and Jesus' body wasn't in there is because the Jewish authorities came out with this claim immediately that Jesus' body had been stolen. Immediately this claim came out. They stole his body. They stole his body. And we see in the second and third centuries that that claim is still around. Um, we have uh, the testimony uh, of a couple of historians. We have Justin and Tertullian um, in the second and third centuries that acknowledge that this claim is still around today. Both acknowledge that the claim that Jesus' body had been stolen is still around. So here's the thing. If Jesus' body was still in the tomb, why would anybody claim that it had been stolen? All they would have to do is go into the tomb, grab the body, and be like, here we go, found Jesus' body. The tomb's not empty, right? That's all they'd have to do. Without a doubt, the tomb was empty. But you might say, Josh, what if the body actually was stolen? What if the Jewish authorities were right, right? That would be the next logical question. Well, our next two sections are going to speak to that. So our third section is Jesus' post-mortem appearances. So we have 12 accounts uh, of appearances by Jesus after his death. Uh, if you look up at the screen, I've put the references up there, and they're also in your bulletins so that you have them to go home. Uh, we see them in John and Matthew and Luke and Mark and 1 Corinthians and in Acts. But Josh, you can't use the Bible to like as any sort of proof here, right? It's not reliable. It's slanted. Um, well, a couple of things, uh, that's a much bigger conversation and one that we're not going to dive into completely today. Um, however, I would like to say a couple of things. Fortunately, uh, Pastor Scott has tackled that topic more in depth in sermon number one of the series. So go ahead and check that out. Can the Bible be trusted? I also listed a number of resources at the bottom of your sheets there uh, to check out and dive into this topic of, man, can we even trust like the Bible or anything that's in there. Uh, a couple of other things is Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Those were originally not intended as these lofty religious writings. 
What they were is guys writing down what happened. They're historical biographies. All they're doing is, man, these important things happened. I need to write this down. And so they did. I, uh, they ended up in the Bible as we know it today so that they could be protected and preserved. Uh, I like the illustration of a safe. You put things into a safe because they're valuable. By putting something into a safe, it doesn't all of a sudden become more valuable. Does that make sense? You put it in there because it's value. It doesn't add value to it because you put it in there. If I was to take my dirty sock and put it in a safe, like it doesn't all of a sudden gain all this value, right? Same is true with the, the books, the letters, the documents that are contained in our Bible today. Um, they were put in there to protect them, to preserve them because they were valuable. Back in the day, Christians were being killed for their beliefs. They had to figure out, man, which of these documents, which of these letters that are circulating around, what, which of these are worth dying for? And so they contained them all, boom, we've got our Bible today. Does that make sense? Okay, so that's just a little bit, two seconds on that, I know. Uh, look into it more, you should. Um, so we're gonna look at the earliest recorded account of Jesus' post-mortem resurrections. The earliest recorded account um, is from Paul. He wrote a letter to this church in the city of Corinth. He wrote a couple of letters. Uh, the one that we're gonna look at is today called 1 Corinthians, and we're gonna look in uh, ver chapter 15, verses four through eight. It's up here on the screen. That he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared also to me. So, what's going on here? After Jesus was killed and buried and the tomb was empty, things that we've already covered, Paul here is claiming that he raised from the dead and then he appeared to all these different people, to Peter, that's Cephas, to the 12 disciples, to 500 plus people, to James, who was his half brother, and then last of all, to Paul himself. Now, this first letter to the Corinthians was written about 15 to 25 years after the resurrection. Basically, what Paul is saying here to the church at Corinth is these beliefs that Jesus rose from the dead physically. These have been going on ever since Jesus' death. For the last 15 to 25 years, whatever it was, people have been believing this. There are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of witnesses. All you need to do is go and talk to somebody. They'll tell you it happened. Oh, by the way, I'm one of those witnesses. I saw Jesus alive after his death. I am verifying for you. I am telling you he rose from the dead. Now, moving on to our last section, um, I get it. Some people are like, I still can't, I'm not gonna take any of it because it was in the Bible. I don't trust any of it. That's fine. However, uh, this next section corroborates, it is our substantiating evidence as to why we can take these accounts to be true. And that is the drastic transformation of different groups and individuals. The first group that we're gonna look at is the church. The early church exploded. In the very short time right after Jesus died, the church exploded. We actually have numbers. There were 12,000 people right there in Jerusalem that decided to follow Jesus and be a part of this movement and willing to die for him, claiming that he was God in the flesh. The population of Jerusalem at the time was um, anticipated or is estimated to be about 50,000 people. That means 25% of the city, boom, all of a sudden starts worshiping Jesus as God, willing to die for him. Crazy. Um, what happened for this drastic, drastic explosion of growth? As I said, early on, Christians were being killed and persecuted for their beliefs. The Romans kind of viewed... Um, viewed this Christian thing as a rebellion. They wanted to squash it and just end it all. Uh, there was a fire that happened in Rome in the year 64. And the emperor at the time, Nero, he blamed the Christians for it and kind of wanted to just get everybody on board with blaming the Christians for it. We see that there's a Roman historian named Tacitus back from the first century. Um, and he wrote this, speaking about the whole situation. Um, Tacitus said this, Nero fastened the guilt, for the fire that is, 
on a class hated for their abominations called Christians by the populace. Christus, from whom the name had its origin, suffered the extreme penalty during the reign of Tiberius at the hands of Pontius Pilate. And a most mischievous superstition, thus checked for the moment, again broke out not only in Judea, the first source of the evil, but even in Rome. Okay, so a few notes from the writings of Tacitus, a non-Christian Roman historian in the first century. He speaks of these Christians who were named after Christ. He mentions that Christ suffered the extreme penalty, crucifixion and death during the reign of Tiberius and Pontius Pilate. And he mentions a mischievous superstition, all this talk of him rising from the dead, which caused growth. And not only in Judea, but also in Rome. So this thing is blowing up. It is spreading across the ancient world. And the question becomes, why become a Christian? Why follow this Jesus movement when the only thing that you have waiting for you is persecution, torture, and death? Outside of Jesus' actual resurrection, I don't see anything that makes any sense. I believe the resurrection is also the best explanation for the transformation of the disciples. We already mentioned the disciples did not think that Jesus was going to rise from the dead. When he died, they went into hiding. They tucked tail and ran, hiding for their lives. Then, all of a sudden, this drastic change. They become bold. They go from this weak, crying, scared group to bold, proclaiming Jesus as Lord, proclaiming him as God in the flesh, and going around telling everybody about it, don't care what happens to them. 10 of the last 11 disciples are all killed for their faith in Jesus. What causes that change? It wasn't Jesus' death. When Jesus died, they went into hiding. Something happened very shortly after that that changed their lives and ultimately they died for it and they claim it's that Jesus rose from the dead. A couple of individuals that are worth talking about as well. Um, James, Jesus' half-brother, So if you had a half-brother, just imagine, you have a half-brother and he comes to you and says, I'm God, you should follow me and listen to the things I do and worship me. What would be your response? You probably wouldn't be on board and neither was James. James was not on board the Jesus train during Jesus' life and ministry. Not about it, not a follower, very skeptical. Then Jesus dies. Then all of a sudden, James has this drastic, crazy life change. All of a sudden, he is a leader in the local church. He is proclaiming his half-brother as God in the flesh and worships him and ultimately is killed for his faith in Jesus. He claims that he saw Jesus in the flesh. We see that in Paul's letter to the Corinthian church. Lastly, uh, we have Saul of Tarsus. If you've been around the church uh, very much, you know Saul of Tarsus' story. Uh, We know him as the Apostle Paul. He was one of the greatest threats, one of the greatest enemies of the early Christian church. He was going around from city to city, grabbing Christians, throwing them in jail, handing them over to be tortured and killed. He hated this Christian movement early on, hated it. All of a sudden, boom, switch flipped. Acts chapter nine, we see the story. He claims he saw Jesus in the flesh and he changes everything. He becomes one of the greatest missionaries the Christian faith has ever seen, and ultimately is killed for his faith that Jesus was God in the flesh and for worshiping him. In review, to kind of just like wrap up where we've gone so far, uh, Jesus died via crucifixion, and I think that's pretty much a slam dunk. We know where he was buried. We know that the tomb was empty because nobody could produce Jesus' body. Um, for sure the tomb was empty and we can be confident that his body wasn't stolen because of this two-part corroborated evidence that so many people claimed they saw the risen Jesus, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of witnesses verified by the transformation, this drastic transformation of all those groups affected and the surrounding uh, areas. Now claiming that Jesus is God, worshiping him, willing to die for those beliefs. I, uh, my intent today, uh, I know that I can be very passionate and even seem, I think maybe a little forceful, I don't know. Um, but my intent for those that are still skeptical, still trying to figure things out and ask questions, I think that's great. Um, 
My hope is that today maybe even just started some more questions or hopefully it answered some. Um, however, if you're still in that boat, that is absolutely all right. And I'm really glad that you're here. And uh, I would love to even dialogue more, um, just even privately would be sweet. Um, however, I would argue that now the burden of proof um, lies with you. And I believe that um, it's up to you to come up with a historically, um, uh, historically accurate uh, alternative, something that uh, is feasible based on all the facts that we have um, and all the evidence that we do have. Um, I would just contend, uh, look into it and come up with a historically feasible alternative. Um, and I would love to discuss and dialogue with that further. Um, however, I would argue that the actual resurrection, Jesus' physical resurrection, like he said he would, is the best explanation for all the evidence that we have, and it requires the least amount of faith than any other worldview concerning this topic. That being said, um, I know that we've been in a, in a series that's been very heady and just kind of like using our brains a lot, and I think that's good. I think that's really sweet. Um, but I love that the Lord doesn't just leave us to using our brains. I love that the Lord pursues our hearts um, and wants our hearts in the middle of it. So as we conclude this series uh, on apologetics and asking for a friend, um, I just wanted to close with a really cool story about uh, God's goodness and his pursuit of even Lindsay's and my heart over the last few weeks and months. Um, after JJ passed uh, a few months back um, and kind of everything just went down with him, we decided that we wanted to just get away over the holidays and just kind of be gone for Christmas and New Year's and clear our heads, spend some time together, spend some time with the Lord and really honestly just be away. And uh, so after... Uh, long story short, we just kind of decided that we were going to try and see the Northern Lights. We figured, man, when else are we going to be traveling over winter? Let's go for it. So we did some research and trying to figure out like where to go. And we landed on this tiny little city up in Northern Norway, up in the Arctic Circle called Tromso. And uh, just in research found that the Northern Lights are kind of elusive, hard to see. You might as well pick a place where there's other things to do in case you can't see the lights because chances are you might not. So we also found that it was wise to book a tour with a guide, somebody that knew that what they were doing so that they could kind of take us out and show us around and get us to where we needed to go in order to see the lights. So we booked two tours in advance, months out. And uh, we get there, we get on our first tour, we start driving with our guide and he's getting in and out of the van every once in a while. And what he's doing apparently is he's looking for clear skies. If you can see the stars up in the sky, then you can see the Northern Lights if there's Northern Lights activity. You kind of need all the stars to align and everything needs to work out perfectly and hope that you see them, basically. Um, so he's kind of doing his thing and uh, we're driving through the Arctic, so it's like blizzarding at times, and it was pretty wild. We're in the car for a while. All of a sudden, he comes back in the car after one of his little like jaunts out into the open, and he uh, comes back, and he's like, we have activity, and uh, he pulls the camera, and he shows us all, and there's this beautiful green streak across the sky on his camera, and so we all hop out of the car. We're so fired up, look out, and we're like, where is it? <laughs> like, where is this thing? And he's like, see that, that streak across the sky? We're like, oh, that thing that kind of looks like a cloud and isn't green at all? Yeah, that's the Northern Lights. Oh, cool. That's sweet. Uh, it was super underwhelming, like very much so. And uh, nonetheless, we got some pictures. He took some pictures of us with it. We have this first picture uh, with the Northern Lights. It looks cool, right? Yeah, it didn't look like that at all. Um, not at all. Very underwhelming. It was like, whatever. We kind of left that tour and we're like, well, at least we got to see something, kind of. Apparently, the nights leading up to that, there was zero activity. So like the groups that went out didn't even get this. Like not even a cool picture for social media, you know? Um, so we left that night very, very underwhelmed. And uh, our next tour was for two nights later. And we were talking about, should we cancel? Um, like, I don't know, things aren't gonna get any better. Like the conditions aren't changing. Like, I don't know, is it even worth it? And so we're like, you know what? We're here, we booked it already. Let's just go, it'll be an adventure. It'll be whatever. So two nights later, we get picked up by our, our guide and we hop in the van. We're the last people to get picked up. So we're not even sitting next to each other. Like we're, she's in front of me, I'm behind her. We're like, what is happening? This is the worst. Uh, this, this night is gonna be terrible. Um, and so just very pessimistic, very just like, whatever, let's just go. So we're driving and he's like, 
we're going to Finland, guys. We're like, how long does it take to get to Finland? So we drive two and a half plus hours uh, through the Arctic uh, to get over to the, towards the Finnish border. And uh, we're driving, and I look out the window. I was like, I think I see something. Sure enough, and I say that to the van, sure enough, we pull over on the side of the road, hop out of the van, and we look up, and there's this giant green sky, this giant green streak going through the sky. And we're like, Lindsay and I are freaking out. We can see it with our eyeballs. And we got a picture of that, too. Um, that's us actually witnessing the Northern Lights, which was really, really cool. We were freaking out, right? Because the night before was so lame. And so this time we're like, Lindsay and I are freaking out. Everybody else is like, hmm, the Northern Lights. You know, it's like, <laughs> guys, this is awesome. Uh, so the guide is like, trust me, trust me. Hop back in the van. We're going to keep going. I've got a spot for us up there. So we hop back in the van. We cross the Finnish border and we go out into this Arctic, like tundra field. And we set up camp. We set up camp, we're sitting around, and all of a sudden the sky starts filling up with the lights. I've got a couple of pictures. Here's this first one as we're sitting at our camp. Just from one side of the sky all the way to the other. Uh, it looks just like this to the naked eye, super beautiful. If you go to the next picture, you'll see just like the density at which it filled up the sky. Really, really beautiful. Uh, and we're like getting our pictures taken with it and super excited. And like, again, Lindsay and I are still like, we're freaking out more. And everybody else, like they've elevated slightly, but we're like clearly like the freaks in the group. Um, we go and Lindsay and I are taking a photo with the lights and we're so excited and everybody else starts geeking out. Everybody else starts yelling and screaming. We're like, what's happening? You have to stay really still during the photos because it's a two second exposure. So we're like, what is happening? You know, trying to like look back behind. Uh, we turn around after the photo and the sky is dancing. I've got, a, I've got a video. If you go to this next video, it's hard to see, but the sky just starts dancing and moving. It's turning pinks and purples. It's changing colors. And it is just this absolute magical show of the Northern Lights. And we're just like, jaw, you know, just like jaw dropped, yelling, like jumping, like I'm like hugging and high-fiving people. Um, <laughs> Just like freaking out, one of the coolest just displays ever. We were sitting in this field for about three hours and we got two or three different shows just like this throughout the night. Um, and at the end of one of the shows, uh, the Lord just blew our minds and uh, the Northern Lights kind of move and shift and form into this perfect J. Um, we have a picture of it right there. And then the J splits into two and it says JJ up in the sky. Um, and then it splits again and it's a third J, uh, or JJ with Jesus. And um, Lindsay and I were just like blown away. Lindsay's like bawling her eyes out. You can see in this photo, she's even crying. Um, just bawling her eyes out and just like so overwhelmed. Um, the last like months leading up, we felt like we'd just been like clinging on, you know, just like clinging on to truth. We know this to be true. Like we know it is with our heads and we don't feel it with our hearts, um, but we know it. And uh, the Lord was just like, I love you. Literal love letter in the sky. I've got JJ. He's good. I love you. I'm pursuing your heart. And uh, we were just, just blown away. Um, we're, we've been talking about this a lot, uh, just like one of the coolest moments that we've ever experienced um, in our lives and probably will ever experience. And uh, we were talking about it and just like what the Lord was speaking to us even through the Northern Lights and uh, just how there was so much disappointment and, and pessimism and waiting. And um, the Lord just saying, you have no idea what I'm capable of, Josh and Lindsay no idea. And uh, we didn't take that as a promise for this life or a promise for future family or a promise of Josh and Lindsay, you have no idea what I'm going to do with your future family. I'm going to provide all this amazing family. We didn't take it as that. Um, maybe, but maybe it's just the promise of eternity um, in heaven. Lindsay and I have been thinking about eternity a lot lately. And um, Josh and Lindsay, you have no idea what I'm capable of. Um, we were told we hit the jackpot this night when it comes to the Northern Lights. We never in our wildest dreams imagined that we'd see the show that we saw and then for the Lord to cap it off with JJ in the sky. Um, you have no idea, Josh and Lindsay, what I'm capable of. Um, so I don't, I don't know the storm that you may or may not be in. 
Um, but you have no idea what the Lord is capable of. You have no idea what the Lord has in store for us, whether that's just in eternity or if it's in the future. Um, the Lord is pursuing your heart, whether it feels like it or not. Um, he loves you. And uh, man, just what a sweet reminder that was for us and so needed um, for us. I love that he gives us enough and he gives us what we need when we need, when we need it. Um, I've said multiple times, today that sometimes just our heads need to lead in the charge with our relationship with the Lord when our heart's not feeling it. Um, but man, the Lord is consistently pursuing our hearts. Um, maybe there's, there's somebody out there, maybe there's one of you out there that, um, I don't know, you're trying to figure things out, skeptical, just trying to look into things and the Lord has been pursuing your heart and you can kind of feel it. You know that the Lord's been coming for you. Um, my hope is that today was helpful as far as just like the logical and reason things and maybe evidence for the resurrection is that light bulb click moment. Like, man, this makes sense. And if Jesus died and rose from the dead, like, I don't need anything else. That's enough. Maybe today's the day. Um, maybe you still have questions, but you just know, like, the Lord is coming after me. I need to, like, I need to make a decision. I need to follow him with my everything. Um, we figured at the end of this series, especially as we've just been diving into stuff, that it'd be silly to, to move on without giving people a chance to respond. Um, and so here in a moment, I'm going to give you a chance to respond uh, and pray a prayer with me. But I just wanted to say a couple of things even before we got to that is, first of all, um, my hope is that this isn't emotional or contrived decision. Um, yeah. Even Jesus himself, when he talks about following him, he, he tells people, you should count the cost. You should see if it's worth it because I'm asking for everything. When, Jesus at, when you give your life to Jesus, he wants it all. He wants 100%, no holding back. Um, so count the cost if that's you. However, on the other hand, man, if the Lord is calling, there's no better time than today to accept the best deal in the history of the universe. Sure, we have to give him our everything, but we get his everything. And I promise you, his everything is a whole lot more than we could ever imagine, a whole lot more than we could ever attain on our own. It is the best deal that you'd ever uh, get in your entire life. If that's you, if this morning you're saying, yep, I'm, he's been pursuing me. I'm surrendering my life to him. I'm following him with everything. I'm choosing Jesus' death as payment for all my stuff so that I can get all the goodness that comes with Jesus' resurrection. If that's you, would you pray this prayer with me this morning? Heavenly Father, thank you so much for pursuing my heart. I know I am a sinner. I know that I need you to make me clean. I know I can't do it by myself. Thank you for sending Jesus to do that, to make me clean. Today, I choose Jesus' death as payment for my sin once and for all. Thank you that Jesus didn't stay dead, but that he conquered death. Thank you that he conquered death for me. In return, Lord, I give you everything. Here's my life. Take it. It's yours. I love you. Heavenly Father, I, uh, I just thank you for a chance to be here together. I thank you for a chance to dive into just some reasonable things and logical things and evidence for the resurrection. Um, Lord, I just thank you that you died for me. I thank you that you conquered death. I thank you that I have no idea what you have in store for me, whether that's in this life or in eternity. I thank you for your goodness. I thank you for pursuit of our hearts. Um, that you don't just leave us out there wondering, that you give us what we need when we need it. We love you. We're thankful. Pray all this in the name of, of your son, Jesus. Amen. In a moment, I'm, uh, I'm gonna give those of you that prayed that prayer for the first time an, an opportunity to respond. Um, here in a moment, I'm gonna count to three and I'm gonna have those that prayed that prayer for the first time and surrendered their lives to Jesus for the first time ever to stand to their feet. One as a declaration of, Jesus, I'm following you. I want everybody to see it. And for all of us to see, man, they're in the family. That's sweet. Um, after that, uh, after we've got new family members standing on their feet, or if not, that's okay. We're gonna stand to our feet and worship the risen Lord together. Does that sound good? So if that's you, if you prayed that prayer for the first time this morning, 
Uh, on the count of three, I'm gonna have you stand at your feet and then everybody else, we're gonna cheer and join in celebrating with the angels of heaven. If you prayed that prayer for the first time this morning, one, two, three. Yeah. Jesus has conquered the grave. He has conquered death once and for all. And it is incredibly logical to say so. Isn't that amazing? And we've got a new family member today. Come on, church. Let's go. Hey, if, there is, uh, if there's something that we could be praying for you for, uh, we've got some people down front to pray for you. Uh, otherwise, have a wonderful day. We'll see you back at three for the Super Bowl. Go Bears! <laughs>